Welcome everybody to our monthly live chat. Uh, this is this is uh, October last time I checked, and you know we do this every month, so we must be doing this in the month of October. Our monthly live chat. I, first of all, I want to make a, a do a sound check. We have uh, Mary and Dennis saying hello to every, and hello to you too, folks are just beginning to come in. So we'll kind of just uh, uh, shoot some bull here for a little while, give more people time to come in uh, before we really get started. So uh, uh, first thing I want to know before I say too much is uh, let me know if the sound's working. Let me know if you can hear me. Just one of you uh, who happens to be logged in. You got thumbs up? Okay, thumbs up on that. Wonderful. Okay, so as we always do, uh, the way, well, first of all, the way this works, I guess maybe I need to introduce that because there are always folks who tune in for the first time and wonder what the heck is that going on with that woman with flowers behind her today and <laughs> any any kind of uh, images just might appear behind me on a, on a monthly Sunday. Anyway, good sound. Thanks, Deb. Uh, what am I saying? Oh, yes. <laughs> Uh, the way it works is that um, we, we begin the session with showing you a video where I have introduced the concept to you. Today's concept is contrast as a tool. Um, not just failure contrast, that's all I'll tell you for the moment. But anyway, so we'd like to keep these focused on a particular topic. That's today's topic. For those of uh, in order to be able to ask questions, you have to be a member. Um, so that just means all you do is click on that join button that you see on your screen somewhere, and uh, in the in the, the little deal will come up that allows you to join, at four ninety nine a month, which is not much considering not only do you get to ask questions during the chat, but you also get a free, a monthly lesson free from my hundred and seventy lessons on uh, the website dyingminds.com. I give a coupon code every month, uh, we give a coupon code every month for you to get a free lesson. And those are really popular. We're getting some really good feedback on that. So folks must, must be enjoying it. As long as folks are enjoying it, we'll keep doing it. So that's how it works. Uh, we wish we could allow everybody who's watching to uh, ask questions, but then there would be so many questions, uh, it would be difficult to manage. So this is our way of managing. All right, let's... Uh, Let's see who's checking in, saying hello, hello back to, I already said, Dennis and Mary and Cheryl and Kevin and Eve, Sheila, Deb, Mary Ellen, Joni, uh, Kevin again, half second audio delay relative to video. Does that mean that my uh, speech is lagging behind the sound? Your lips are moving in the future, yes. My lips are moving in the future. Well, can we do anything about that? Um, Looking at settings right now, I, okay. I have everything set already, but uh, I don't know why. All right, maybe you just don't watch me. <laughs> uh, maybe Roger can get that corrected. Hey, Maggie, glad to see you checking in. <clears throat> so I think maybe there are enough of you on board now that we can go ahead and get started. Maybe while the video is playing, hi, Sue. Uh, while the, hi, Carolyn. Uh, while the... Um, video is playing, while the uh, intro video is playing, perhaps then uh, Roger can find what's causing the synchronization of the sound to be behind. I'm talking in the future or something like that. Okay, so are we ready, Roger, Roger to run the, the uh, video? We are. All right, let's go ahead and do that. Here, uh, d if, you, if you will, I let me remind you to, if you have questions, and you might have questions on this one, if you have questions, jot them down and then wait until after the uh, video to ask them. And that way we can keep up with it better. And you won't be thinking about the, writing the question down when I'm explaining something. That's the old teacher in me. Okay, let's roll that video and I'll see you on the other side. Contrast as a tool means that we're using contrast itself in order to make things happen in our paintings that we want to happen. It's not just value contrast, though that's what a lot of folks mean when they say contrast, 
but it's also contrast of direction, shape, value, yes, color, texture, and size. These are the things we use when we contrast. But it's the degree of the contrast that really makes things work for us. Let's begin with value. What you're looking at here is one value, no contrast. We don't really have anything to compare it with. We just know that we see a single value with no contrast. Well, let's add a degree of contrast here. All right. Now we have two values. Very close in value relationship. Very close in contrast. Let's add another value and get another comparison. Now we have a stronger value contrast. We have three values now. This one and this one that has a very close contrast. This one and this one that have a stronger contrast. This one with this one has a stronger contrast than this one with this one. Let's create an even different contrast in this area right here. Now we have even a stronger contrast between this one and this one than we do between this one and this one and this one and this one or this one and this one. We have a, a closer contrast between this one and this one than we do between this one and this one. So that's what we mean by degrees of value contrast. Let's create another contrast. Now we have the strongest value contrast possible between the lightest light and the darkest dark. On this side, we have the closest value contrast possible between this value and this value. So that's what we mean by degrees of value contrast. It's the degree of value contrast that causes us to see everything the way we see it, no matter the color, no matter the direction, no matter the texture, no matter what. If the degree of value contrast is close, it does not attract our eye to the same degree that our eye is attracted when the degree of value contrast is stronger. Now let's use degrees of value contrast to create some texture. So I'm just going to create some random texture as we move along. And what I want you to notice is we're getting two degrees or three degrees of value contrast that enable us to see that texture. But I add a little bit more contrast of a different kind and you see what happens we begin our eye begins to get more interested in this contrast because it is a stronger contrast it doesn't matter whether it's lighter or darker the fact that it's a stronger contrast attracts our eye well let's add some darker and see now do you see we have a broader range, a wider range of degrees of contrast now because we have a broader range of darks to lights within this area. Now if we're talking about textural contrast, we're referring to the amount of activity or busyness, or some people call it rough against smooth, of the activity of one area versus the smoothness of another area comes in degrees. Now one way I can show you that is we can do it in amounts. We can add more texture and create a larger degree of textural contrast. Add even more texture up here and now we're getting more texture, a more of the busy texture than we are of the smooth texture and that is degrees. Now if I begin to take it away I decrease the degree of textural contrast by taking away the amount of contrast. I can take away still more of the amount of contrast and I've decreased the degree of textural contrast. But we wouldn't see the texture contrast without the value contrast. Nor would we see the textural contrast without the directional contrast. 
Direction is the visual movement. It's the angle at which a visual movement is taking place. This movement is going in this direction. This movement is going in this direction. This lighter movement is going in this direction. The overall movement of this patch of texture is going in a horizontal direction. If I add another patch of movement going straight up, now we have a patch of movement going in a vertical direction that contains within it many different directions of movement. We have contrast of direction when we have two different movements going in a different direction. Vertical against horizontal is contrast of direction. Vertical or horizontal against any diagonal is directional contrast. In this scene, we have lots and lots of directional movement. We have verticals, verticals where most of the tree trunks are carrying verticals. We have horizontals, horizontals, horizontals. We have diagonals. There's another horizontal and diagonals. A lot of contrasting directions. In this picture, we have not so many. We have a lot of similar directions. Lots of horizontal. That's one reason this feels relatively peaceful. We have lots of horizontals here in the landscape, the way the sheep are lined, are lined up, the feeling of these sheep going horizontal here. We have very gentle diagonals here that are contrasting, but they're very gentle contrast, whereas in the former picture, we saw a more active contrast of direction. So these two scenes are good examples of degrees of directional contrast. Now, we've seen that the ability to contrast value enables us to create the ability to contrast direction, and that all those two things enable us to create texture, but contrasting direction also enables us to create shape. So let me show you. Let's use this, the shape of this sheep. We can begin anywhere, but I'll begin right here. That is a direction. That direction changes and moves in this direction. That direction changes and moves in this direction. That direction changes and moves in this direction. That direction changes, moves in this direction. Another direction changes and moves in this direction. You see where I'm going here? By changing direction, we are able to create edges which create shape. And needless to say, the ability to create shape is absolutely necessary in our ability to create paintings. When I say change, I mean contrast. The change of any one element from one state into another is a contrast. And the degree of that change determines the degree of contrast. Then our ability to change value and our ability to change direction, enabling us to create shape, also enables us to create variations in sizes of those shapes. And that ability to create a large size here of an animal's very similar created in a very small size here enables us to show distance. This one being further in distance from this one shown in this size communicates that distance. So even though size also shows the proportion of one thing to the other, in our painting, we can use it to create distance. And that brings us to color. Color is the only one of our elements that can contrast within itself. It doesn't depend on the other elements in order for us to see images. We know from black and white photography that we can read images without color, but color plays its own independent role. I want to give you just a primer 
on the three ways color can contrast. Those of you who've studied color in depth, especially with me, have already been introduced to this, but as a reminder, we have the three parts of color, which are the hue of the color, as we see around the color wheel. And on my reader, the hues are moving in this direction right here, just the hues. We have the value of the color, which is in, shows here in this band on the color reader, but the value of the color is dark to light of any hue of any saturation. Dark to light, determined, of course, about by how much light is being caught by the image or how much shadow, how much is in shadow. The saturation of the color is, in essence, less hue. So when, when one complement is added to another, it subtracts out the hue and we have a lower saturation. Then as we would add blue-green to red-orange, this happens. See how that, this changes right here, the saturation. Add more blue-green to red-orange, and this happens. Less saturated, less red-orange left. As we continue that, you see, watch this change. Eventually, we can balance those so that no hue is left in either direction, and we get a total neutral. That when we say contrast in color, we're not just talking about contrast in hue. We're talking about how color behaves when either two hues are side by side or two saturations of a hue are side by side or when two values of hues are side by side. Now that is contrasting color. Let's stop now and give you a chance to ask your questions. All right, uh, I, we apologize for this, uh, this audio delay. I hope that it doesn't distract you so badly that you can't really uh, benefit from our discussion today. So I don't know, maybe you can find some way to psych yourselves out so that the uh, delay doesn't bother you. I can't think about it too much or I'll get inhibited because I can't figure out how to make, uh, make my voice delay <laughs> past the audio. I don't know. There must be something in the future where human beings will be able to do that. Meanwhile, all right, uh, <laughs> serendipity. Your head is spinning in a good way. I'm glad to hear it. I love to spin heads around. But uh, any particular question? I was thinking this morning about, I'm always thinking about how the, the um, how uh, in the visual, we learned those visual elements from nature. Uh, okay, Cheryl says, would you please speak something, speak to something I love, which is simultaneous contrast. I love that too, Cheryl. <clears throat> you know, did you know that simultaneous contrast was, uh, well, I think simultaneous contrast was labeled back in the 1800s by Chevreau, uh, who did some in-depth investigation into how color affects color and wrote a book on it called uh, The Contrast of Color, I think it's called. But the sad thing was uh, they didn't have any ability to reproduce the color. He has all kinds of uh, explanations. I mean, not just explanations, but he has uh, experiment after experiment after experiment into the hundreds of um, experiments he did with observing color, colors effect upon color and and didn't have a way to show that in color and so, anyway that's just a little side line, a little historical reference there simultaneous contrast as a broad definition means the effect that one color has upon another color now a color in isolation um, it doesn't really do a whole lot until we put another color beside it so it's the contrast that causes the one color to affect another. So, for example, um, 
one of the ways that we can observe simultaneous contrast in action is the way that at the same value level, one saturation of a color, of a hue, at the same value level, beside another saturation will cause it to, to sort of vibrate, giving a luminosity. Another way we can observe it is that when we have a total neutral background or an area of total neutral, and then we have a disk within that that is any color, say, say if we have a red hue, a disk of a red hue in that, that background will appear green because of the simultaneous contrast. One color uh, either emphasizes the color beside it or uh, in some way contrast with the color beside it in whatever way. Now, if it's the hue, if the hue is being contrasted, then those two are going to enable us, one's going to enable us to see the other more, so that if they, for example, uh, let's see, we can almost see that, no, that's value contrast. <clears throat> if, uh, let's go back to the red-green, because that's one everybody recognizes as being uh, contrasted complements opposite each other. If we have uh, imagine a, a green forest where it's not the high saturation of green. Nature never is unless it's in flowers, and that's not as often as you might think. But in, say you have a, a forest in the summertime, and they're all different shades of green, you can see a cardinal, a male cardinal, in that forest at a really pretty good distance if you can see all the, uh, you can see you know, a good bit of the color because the color, the hue of that cardinal is opposite the hue of the green. And so the green, the red contrasts with the green in such a way that it causes us to see it better. So that is a kind, according to Chevreau, that is a kind of simultaneous contrast. Although I know that the term simultaneous contrast gets confused, uh, I guess narrowed. A lot of times people have a narrow definition of it. But it really is when color effect, the way color affects color. Uh, and so you could actually say, uh, well, let me, let me back up and say something else. Um, we have three, those three ways that color can affect color. The way hue can affect hue. If a hue is in the vicinity of other hues that it's related to, for example, if yellow is in, in the vicinity of the yellow, green, and red, orange, and there's yellow in both of them, all we're going to have a feeling of harmony with all of that, but the, 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 the colors that are not in the, do not have the yellow in them, are going to be more visible because they are different in hue, they're contrasted in hue. That didn't sound really clear, I hope it, but then the, the saturation is contrasted. Now, I, I went through that ex explanation of what happens with saturation uh, when, a, when a complement is mixed into, a, when two complements are mixed together. One of them is going to lose hue, like if you're mixing any, any two complements you mix together. When you start mixing one into another, the one that gets mixed into it is going to lose hue because they neutralize each other. That's the whole deal, the way they behave. And so when you have one, uh, uh, you have any hue, so let's say the hue of red-violet, for example, the one behind me, that's a red-violet right up there, right there. Um, if you notice, the red-violet just closest to my head is a little bit over here, it's a little bit more saturated than the red violet you see in the shadow areas. Oh, that really becomes more blue violet, but it really is there. Now, if those two are side by side at the same value, that saturation is going to, the lesser saturation emphasizes the more highly saturated. And, and so they, that, that's what happens in the simultaneous contrast. They're affecting each other simultaneously. Um, Cheryl, I probably rambled a little bit on that because uh, 
and just because sometimes I ramble, but did that help? Now let's see. Maggie says, if the sound lip lynch thing Oops. were the worst thing that happens today, I would be well. <laughs> I agree, Maggie. <laughs> yeah, there have been times when, uh, uh, never mind. <laughs> so, um, simultaneous contrast is a wonderful thing to work with because it is, uh, it is a, it's one thing that artists can use to create depth where the other ones they might just choose a single color. Now, if you want to see a good example of how simultaneous contrast is used, look at Richard Schmidt's work. Also, well, that's one thing that, that makes Richard Schmidt such a masterful painter. Uh, but also John Singer Sargent, he, he used the simultaneous contrast an awful lot, where in, in his case, in both of their cases, the simultaneous is warm, cool, warm, cool. Uh, warm, cool is the same thing as, uh, well, it, it's the hue, it's the hue uh, being changed when something is warm, cool. Somehow the hue is being changed. It's either being changed towards another hue or it's being changed in saturation. And then when they're put side by side within a single image that creates a vibrancy in a depth, that enables that, uh, uh, that's the simultaneous contrast that creates a richness of hue. The whole thing will, might feel gray, for example. Um, <clears throat> there's lots of examples of uh, in Sargent's work where something is neutral. And he, instead of making a gray, just a gray for that, he will use a, a neutral that has a little bit more hue in it on the cool side and another neutral in the same same value of range, and another hue that's a little bit warmer on the other side, and then stroke those si uh, um, uh, together, make adjacent strokes of those where the strokes are sort of blended. The whole image together feels you communicate gray, as in gray rock or something like that, but it has a depth and a vibrancy to it that it wouldn't have if he just mixed a gray of different values. So that's the effects, uh, uh, one of the effects that simultaneous contrast can have. Uh, Dennis asks, I will never understand value in hue or saturation. I understand contrast. The lone tree in the pasture would be rather dramatic contrast to the horizon of the pasture. You know what, Dennis? I think you can understand it because it's all about what color does. So... You want me to see you said never understand the value or the hue or the saturation. Um, hue. Roger, can you throw the color wheel on the screen for me? Yeah. Okay, that would help an awful lot. Let me just talk to Dennis here just a little bit. And, uh, oh, Cheryl says it was perfect. Cheryl, you're kind. I'm not so sure it felt like I was rambling, but anyway. Okay, now, here's the color wheel. Now, Dennis, hang, hang, hang in there with me for just a minute. First one thing, hue. The, the hues are the colors themselves. They are colors, uh, the colors that move around, if I could just get my finger right. The yellow, we see the yellow. Y'all, I'm d working backwards here. You see the yellow, that's a hue. Yellow leans towards yellow-orange. That's yellow hue, yellow-orange hue. That's just hue, that is not value. That is not saturation, that's just hue. All those colors around the color wheel represent every possibility we have for hue. Not every possibility we have for mixing hue, every possibility we have for hue. Now, that's hue. When, when that changes, uh, when, when that gets lighter, say take a, Let's go right here. There is red violet. Now, if that I don't the, the color wheel doesn't show this. This little uh, color saturation wheel I have here doesn't show that. The color wheel doesn't show you anything about value. Nothing, zero whatsoever. It only shows you about hue. That red violet. If I put white into it, it's still going to be red violet. Look behind my head here but it's still the red violet hue. That's hue, but I've changed this value. If I make it lighter, I'm gonna change this value. That is the value. If I, if I, if, I uh, uh, if, if it falls into shadow, 
it's going to get darker. That is its value, but still it's red violet hue. So that's the hue. Now I explained the saturation or the intensity. Intensity, saturation, chroma, those are all the same, uh, those are all the same words, saturation. I explained saturation uh, as to what happens there. It's a matter of you always have to have two hues working. So if, for example, let's go back to red violet, look at look the opposite of red violet is yellow green right up here. So if I start adding a little bit of yellow green to red violet, I'm knocking down knocking out some of its hue and it gets less saturated. And more of that yellow green into it, it knocks out more of the hue. That is saturation. We, that can happen at any value level. So, you know, I think a little concentration on that, maybe doing a few exercises where, where you're doing that, you will understand it. It, it. And it really is fascinating when we start working those principles together in our painting. So, okay, that, that was between Dennis and me and the rest of you. Hope you got something from it too. Uh, Cheryl says, my, okay, we got that one. Uh, Sheila, would brush stroke technique and direction help to create contrast as well? <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> now remember the contrast includes direction, uh, includes, con includes value, uh, includes all the things, that, all the visual elements we work with. So a part of what we do with a brush stroke will help create that. Uh, let's see, would brush stroke technique and, and direction help to create contrast? Yeah. So if we were, for example, if I have a brush loaded with one value, uh, but I'm placing it in an area of another value, and I'm pulling it in a particular direction, I have created now a contrast in value and a contrast in direction because I've changed, made a direction. Well, let's say, depending on what other angles are there. Remember direction or the direction has to do with the angles of visual movement. And uh, so every time an angle changes, we have a contrast. So if I have an angle going this way and I have one going this way, I have a contrast of angles. Here I don't, I have parallel angles here. If, I, if you're just looking at my hands and, and, uh, and I'm just going vertical, that's a parallel, that's not a contrast. <clears throat> Pardon me, frogs today, but always. But if I do this, I change the angle. I have this angle contrasting with this angle. Also, I can do this. I still have this angle contrasting with this angle. So that's direction contrast. This direction moving horizontal is contrasting with this direction moving diagonal. So every change in angle is a change in direction, and that is contrasting direction. Uh, I hope that helped. And let's see, Penny asked, can't value also contrast with itself? Yes. Uh, you said color is the only element that doesn't need other elements. Um, <clears throat> well, value needs shape in order for us to see it. And if I, you know, if, I, if I've got to justify what I said, uh, that would be the justification. Um, in order to see, in, in, so, so if we're using value, yes, value can contrast with itself. Value often contrasts with itself. Uh, when we're painting and when we're in nature, it's, it's just one of the things value does all the time. Uh, but without, without some shape, we don't see the value. Without some value, we don't see the shape. We need one in order to have the other um, for it to be contrasted. And if you can think of an, uh, of an example that, um, that where it doesn't, let me know and we will we'll see. Yeah, maybe you said thanks for the answer. Maybe, maybe I did okay with it. Doesn't color also use shape? <sighs> color uses shape but it doesn't need shape. Uh, um, now let me see how I can use this shape, but it doesn't need shape. If the color is, if you have, 
All right, let's put it this way. Uh, if I had, if we had on the screen just a, just an area of red violet, one area of red violet by itself, and we didn't have anything else on it, we would still be able to read it as red violet without the shade. Uh, but yet we would read a certain value of red violet, or uh, and that's part of the value is part of of the whole color structure or should I say construction or structure maybe so I think we could split hairs there Penny I think we could split hairs there and uh, I think we could find exceptions and you know I don't really approve of other people saying never and always and that sort of thing let's just say for the most part uh, color can work independently because it has value within it and um, the value is what one thing that enables to see the color. Well, value enables us to see hue. Uh, and so let's just say that, that one, let's take it with a grain of salt. And uh, okay. What about abstract? Abstract. The color and the shape. The color, yeah, in abstract, the, the, there, there will be shape. There'll be shapes in the brush strokes shapes and direction if it doesn't have any imagery in the abstract it's going to have they're going to be direction they're going to be directional movements going to be thickness and thinness of brush strokes that are going to create that are going to be shapes themselves and and that sort of thing uh <clears throat> one <coughs> pardon me one slight exception to that might be the minimalist uh the abstractionist like rothko and uh uh, the ones that were really where they to were totally doing away with as much shape as they could. And they just had the color color merging into color on the screen. Um, but um, all very thoughtful things for consideration. Okay, I said a thank you there and a thank you there and a thank you there. And I said, can value also contrast with itself? Yes. All right, Penny said, doesn't color also use shape? <laughs> Penny, did I did I, did did, did, my, did I get out of that one okay? Because <laughs> yes, we could start. Um, it's like every film. Uh, you know, s sometimes it gets from being, abs uh, from um, from being. Sometimes things can go philosophical on us, and uh, and when they they can move out of the realm of possibility into in more philosophical realms and. And then when that happens, we can we can just argue all day long, and I don't see any real reason for arguing all day long. I just want you to be able to uh, to grasp this stuff and make it work for you in your paintings. And good Lord, uh, you know this is an introduction to that concept of contrast. Now remember that the idea is that it's the contrast itself that we're talking about, but we got so it has to have something to work with. I like to compare it with uh, uh, as a tool. That's the reason I like to call it a tool. There's a lot of discussion these days of how many tools they have in their tool bag and all this kind of stuff. Uh, but I like to think of it as comparable. I say if you have, if you're building a house, uh, the hammer, unless you have one of those guns that shoots nails and stuff like that. In the old days, before they had those guns that shoot nails, <laughs> hammers were very, very important in building houses. Uh, that was a tool, but it didn't work by, it, uh, you, you had to have other tools too to work with it. And uh, I think of uh, a contrast as being a, a tool that has uh, many kinds of ways of working. So we have the tool uh, value, which is, I think, the top on the hierarchy. So I think value is the most important tool we have, especially for creating contrast. And then we have direction, I talked about. But without value, you can't see, without value contrast, you don't see anything. And without um, direction, we don't have shape. Without direction contrast, you can't see shape. So you see, they depend upon each other, just like we, uh, in order to build a house, you need a hammer, uh, you need a saw, and we can go through all those things like that. But you start thinking of it as just a tool. It does something for you. You can make it do stuff. It's not just a principle that you have to follow or not just a rule that you have to follow, but it is a tool that you can make work for you. 
And that to me is the beauty of the whole thing. Penny, yes, I'm trying to understand the statement that color is the only element that doesn't need other elements. I didn't mean to split hairs. Yeah, I know. And I think, yes, it, I think it's important to understand that. Uh, I, I, maybe I... Maybe I made that statement a little bit too final. It's a good thing we're having this discussion. Good thing this is being recorded and that the discussion will clarify the video. Uh, maybe I should have said that color needs other elements least of any other. It is relatively independent uh, within itself. And that's because it has value built into it. We can't have color color can't happen without value it has to but it's the value within the color that makes it the color that we recognize the hue and so on that we recognize so we could write a book about that couldn't we penny we will just co-author a book how about that <laughs> uh cheryl kind of metaphysical color existing without being in a shape like space being in the structure of physical objects. Okay, off track. No, that's not too bad, Cheryl. That's fun to think about. Like space being in, within the structure of a physical object. I wouldn't call that off track. I think that's uh, very relative when we start to give it, um, you know, kind of make that comparison. Uh, you know, going back to the color needing shape, back in the height of, of the abstract expressionist era. You know, the abstract expressionist era, it wasn't just people slinging paint, as like, like a lot of people think. Uh, and it, but it started with uh, people looking at characteristics, looking at the characteristics of images and how, the, how it was possible to change the characteristic of the image and still use other elements that nature gives us. Now, if you think about the Cubist, how they were uh, they were seeing the um, geometric quality in all shapes, and we had we went through the, that. We went through the, uh, and the abstract movement uh, included lots of things. It included some of the abstractionists were working with just the contrast of shapes, a contrast and similarity, similarity of shapes, and some were working with color, and some were working, Jackson Pollock was working just with movement and texture, the, 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 the different kinds of movement, and their rhythm, rhythm was what the main thing was working with, caused and created by movement, which creates the texture, Jackson Pollock, he wasn't just slinging paint, but he was doing something, he was investigating and pursuing um, an idea, about what happened, what can happen in painting. Well, I don't need to go through all that because that's what it's not it's about. But part of what happened, um, there the abstractionist era era that was more of that intellectual stuff, and then the expressionist era era wove into it, and it was about the um, the emotional expression or the movement, uh, the more human involvement, the spiritual emotional involvement, and those two got merged together as time went on to abstract expressionism. But as things began to sort things, as it began to sort themselves out, uh, artists would see just how far they could take an idea of what do you need to make a painting. And we went through the minimalist period where that was what was going on. Uh, that's to answer Cheryl and referring back to Penny. That minimalist period where they were trying to take away as much shape as possible as much value as possible, as much texture as possible, um, as much uh, direction as possible. In other words, they were trying to say, is it possible to do a, an expressive painting with nothing but color? Rothko is a really a good example of, of uh, taking that idea. But there were others, too, that were working. Just check, uh, check out the colorist, check out the, uh, the um, minimalist in, in painting, and you can see that. So yes, it's not un call it's not un uh, it's not out of the realm of discussion that artists can take uh, metaphysical and physical and uh, philosophical ideas uh, and weave them into some concept of painting that we're talking about. All right, I kind of got behind there. Let's see. 
Slinging paint. I like that. <laughs> Dennis. Uh, Eve's enjoying this. Great. I am too. Can you tell? I always enjoy these chats. Um, okay, so everybody's thinking now. I'm guessing everybody's thinking now. Or maybe you've run out of questions. Ah, uh, Cheryl. Here we go. Goody. Going back to what Sheila asked, there is contrast that can be produced by direction of a brush stroke, but also compositional shape direction. Correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, if you think about uh, this directional thing is one that really fascinates me. You know, I'm really, uh, I really love what visual paths can do. And I, uh, the visual path, to my mind, is... Uh, is is a a um, and you may say a little road map we use that guides the eye through the painting and we have some traditional ones uh, and every one of them deals with direction that's why I'm going in there uh, so we have some traditional ones you know the uh, early on we had that triangular path that the classical artists used used a lot where they arranged images so that the I would move from one point of a triangular movement to another, and then from that point to another, and and so the I would, uh, the arrangement there would be a tri triangular relationship. Regardless, you can see that in lots and lots and lots of the classical and the neoclassical paintings. That uh, that, and then of course we have the uh, there's the L path, uh, which is a more relaxed path, a more pastoral path where the uh, L starts on one side, or it could start on either side, and it does. It's the path that just sort of has a vertical, a vertical horizontal, just vertical horizontal relationship of visual movement, uh, which is the direction. That's direction, what direction does. Of course, then the, the, you know, we know the C path, that's a real popular one. Well, it's you know, C and also the circular, they're, they're pretty much the same thing. Uh, where they where it moves like this, the S path, that's a real popular one too. It's also called the Z path, where the visual movement is like a snake, <laughs> like a, a snake's movement, uh, or you know a little bit more abrupt. Usually, if there's a Z path, it uh, it's more of a of a uh, straight line. It'd be more uh, diagonals, more diagonals, movement of diagonals and. Whereas the L path is more movement of verticals and horizontals, all of that can be created with brush strokes. Uh, you, you know, can be um, emphasized with the way the brush moves. And the other part of that is that uh, I like the idea, and this is actually you, if you, uh, those of you that participate in the workshops or that take our courses on the academy or the lessons, know. One of my <clears throat> favorite things to do is use the brush stroke, the angle of the brush stroke, and how it moves to shape images. So finding that movement and that and that uh, directional movement within images, and letting the brush move in that direction in order to shape those images. So I think I might have gone off path. Off, I do get off track. You know that, but that's just something you have to live with. Um, but yes, the. Uh, Direction of the brush stroke, compositional shape direction. Yes, all it all works together, Cheryl. All works together. So remember, uh, there's not uh, shape, uh, direction can be formed in a number of ways, and certainly the time kind of brush strokes we use to shape our images can play a large role in that. Especially if you're more of a, of an all prima. I am. I love I love, love working all prima. Uh, so yes. Uh, Dennis, maybe I do understand hue saturation. Ah, did I get you? Uh, maybe I do understand uh, hue saturation, etc. I see it as color I want, and then uh, as, as a lighter dark. Too simplified? I wouldn't say so. I think it's a good start. Just for you know, if you if you really think about, um, I like to say that color is a chord. Uh, how does that spell? C H O R D chord right musical C chord -E. yeah like a musical chord a musical chord has three, usually either two or three notes but let's say that the traditional three note a musical chord that you can keep you can have the same chord or similar chord and you can change one note and have 
still a very similar chord. Now, if you think about uh, any color you look at has three notes, it has, it's a chord. The hue is one note, so wherever that hue is located, you might say is one note. The saturation of that hue is another note, and then the value of both of the, of the hue, the sat, whatever the saturation of the hue is, the value is another note. And so that's the chord, and then we can change one element of that, have a similar chord. So if we say if we change the uh, saturation, if, if the next stroke we make is just a little bit more saturated, but we've kept it the same value and we've kept it the same hue, and we've changed the chord, changed just one note of the chord, and we could keep moving like that. So uh, give us some, I, I think maybe you may just kind of light bulbs come on, Dennis, uh, but that, not, you know, if you're thinking of, you see the color and I want it, and then it's a light or a dark, not a bad place to start. Let's just add some saturation and some hue to it, and you got it. <laughs> I know I'm going to keep up, I'm going to keep on to you. Uh, Penny, I'll check out the minimalist. Good. I see what you mean about Pollock and the movement. Love your explanations. Thank you. I love to hear you talk in. Helma. Oh. In Clint. I, oh, I love to hear you talk in Helma at Clint. Off Clint. Mm, in the future. Oh, yeah, I can't even read. Well, um, send me a request on the on the quick tips, and I might be able to work out something for you there. Just an idea. Or, uh, I, we it might not be a bad idea for some of these uh, chats if we maybe compare some artists. Just, uh, we could, we could, um, C compare what Clint was doing, compare what Pollock was doing, compare what uh, Rothko was doing, compare what uh, some of the others are. Maybe it would, it would not be a bad chat for us to do that. So if, uh, if, if you folks are in favor of that sort of thing, go into the chat, not this chat, but into the uh, chat section of our, uh, of our quick tips and uh, the comment section of the quick tip and just let me know there in the comment section and we'll see if we can't come up with something that would be meaningful. Where we could, we could, right, we would need to get some uh, photographs of some of the paintings to have ready to for you to see, so we could make it uh, uh, a, vi a visible comparison and discussion. All right, <clears throat> um, Cheryl, again, perfect answer. <laughs> well, Cheryl, I must be scoring today, huh? <laughs> Thank you. I can't wait to listen to this recording again. So much there oh so much thought here it's fast it is fascinating it's a fascinating topic um the whole uh, top, uh, the whole uh, concept of contrast has been one that has fascinated me uh for decades and decades and decades more because it's so uh because it it, it the way we the, the those degrees, the way we use those degrees of contrasting, determines really everything we do, and all that will determines how rich our images are, and how related our images are. And so, yeah, I can really get I really get going on the topic, <laughs> on most topics related to painting. If you haven't noticed, um, okay, Sue, so when you get to the point where you have the choice of type of contrast to use, what considerations do you make? There may be any number of considerations because we make these choices constantly when we're painting. Now, if if I if I could just take you through a brief sequential, I would say a, a brief sequen sequence of organizing. I would say that first, the most important, if you're doing if you're doing realistic painting, if you're doing abstract painting. Um, you are you're not working with images in the same way you you would you are with realistic paintings. But abstract painting, a good abstract painting and a good realistic painting, uh, can be equally masterful, no matter uh, what what the images are. It's how they're put together and how the the various kinds of contrast to use. So I would say it's important to begin with uh, planning planning behind the scene, doing studies behind the scene, 
making first of all decisions about what colors are what color choices are you going to make to use there rather than having uh 10,000 colors out and then you know randomly choosing one and the other one and the other because you like this and like this and like that's that's not what we're talking about uh but if if you really are wanting to get uh a, get yourself acquainted with the concept of working with these varying degrees of contrast begin with color begin with color choices begin with an image if, if you're doing realistic painting begin with an image i don't want to go into the abstract process because it's a little bit different but then when you're working with those images first consideration what is the light doing here we go because that determines so much if it's a if it's a if the if the scene is indirect light, then what time of day is it? Where is that light located in relationship in relation to where you're located? Uh, if it's an overcast light, still same consideration. Uh, but the consideration is a little bit different because the light's coming from everywhere. In other words, it's important that you notice what the what the light is doing. So because that's that's degrees of contrast. So if it's a if it's a light uh, uh, relatively, say if it's uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, if it's direct light, and if you're looking at the light more towards the light source, then all the images between that light source and you are going to be in shadow. That's going to be dark, and they're going to use lots of variations in dark in there, and that's going to be your beginning point for the uh, contrast, the kinds of contrast within as you're working within those areas you're going to have the degree each each section is going to you're going to be translating those degrees of contrast within that section so i would say that your images are going what the images you choose and the way you choose to compose them uh and the way you choose to design them i should say or uh, place them place them is a better not compose because it means everything the way you choose to place the images the, the life source, all of that, how you translate that determines how you make these decisions. But I would say start by making the value decisions first. And that is where's the light source doing and what is the light, what's, where, what's in shadow and what's not in shadow. That's first. And then what happens within that. Um, so, so I hope I didn't make that too general, but uh, I think that's where the considerations to start. Then from that point on, you make the decisions according to, as you're developing the image, according to what it's calling for, what the image is calling for. Make a decision according to what the, the painting is calling for. <clears throat> Joni says, maybe you could talk about contrast and the focal area where it might get the most intense also with accents and highlights. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, <clears throat> well, as the the value contrast the two uh, well if all the if when you if all the directions if the con, if the directions are merging if the directions in the paint are merging towards each other they're going to be pulling your eye all of them going to be pulling your eye in that direction like in one perspective that's going to create that focal area there <clears throat> pardon me and um and so it would <laughs> You would then from that that would then uh, control the focal area. But if you don't have that kind of perspective, if you have a uh, uh, more of an aerial perspective or more you know, not a perspective where you've got one point perspective pulling your eye in, it's, it's a matter of even even with this even with the one point perspective, where the strongest value contrast is is where the eye is going to want to go. If you have too many strong value contrasts, the eye is not going to know where to go. The, clo the closer the value contrast is, or if you have, look behind, let me just move over just a bit, little bit. Which one am I going to go? Let me just move over. You, if you can see there, really the strongest value contrast is right in here. Your eye is sort of pulled towards the center of this flower because all those directions are going towards that center. But if you'll notice, this is a very strong value contrast area right in here. And 
if I get out of the way, if you just close your eye and open your eye, I bet your eye really does go to that, uh, that real strong value contrast first. It'll notice the flower and overall, uh, but if you're just seeing just that much with me still in the picture, that's where your eye's going to go. So also, um, it, it's really, really interesting. Uh, um, I don't know that anybody can really say uh, whether the strong value contrast would pull the eye in first or whether a strong hue contrast would pull the eye in first. In other words, if you have a, a really saturated hue area, of saturated hue within an area of unsaturated or desaturated hue, your eye's going to go there because it's a strong contrast. But I think the perception of the human uh, is going to, some people, for some people, your eye might go there first, but that saturation contrast and the value contrast is where your eye is going to go first. So we're running, oh my goodness, we're already out of time, and John, uh, Johnny, uh, I probably didn't con address that one enough, but we could make that, uh, uh, there's another one we can discuss a little bit more sometime, maybe have a discussion about if you remind me somewhere or somehow. And then Dennis says, a few live chats back, you, you reference an early painter who used light and dark for his work. Very good example of contrast. Yes. Yes. Um, well, you know, there are tonal painters. Uh, tonal painters who don't use, who don't, who use color, but color is not a major element in the work. Well, where they're, they're dealing not just with the contrast, but also gradations too, which is another subject that perhaps we need to address in the chat. Haven't we addressed gradations before? I can't remember. Anyway, we've got to sign off. We are already out of time. YouTube's going to kick us to the curb if we stay on too much longer. So thank you all. Thank you all. It's a very good discussion. Excellent questions. And you got me talking, uh, which is which is the goal, isn't it? So yeah, if you uh, for those of you who are who are, uh, I, I see we have quite a few that are watching us right now. Uh, if you want to become a member. Uh, a, a Studio Insider member, just hit that join button. That's a good thing to do. It's uh, for four ninety nine a month. Uh, not only do you get to ask questions in these chats, but you will also get a free video, a uh, free lesson, a free composing lesson. All my lessons are about composing, and the, all the quick tips, quick tips are have to do with uh, everything, you know, technique, whatever you ask. But the lessons over on diamonds.com, the hour long lessons are all focused on various kinds of composing. So you get one of those free every month for as long as you are a Studio Insider member on YouTube. All right, that's enough. Out of here. Uh, enjoy the rest of your month. And uh, those of you who are in what, Roger? Uh, they can also get the six degree intensity well free. Oh, the six, in, that's right. We have lots of free stuff at diamonds.com. And this six degree intensity wheel that you see right here on the screen, is free there. So you can go there. Go to Diamonds. Go to Diamonds.com. Two N's, D-I-A-N-N-E-M-I-Z-E. Click in the menu on free stuff, and you got lots of free stuff there. I'm out. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. All right, bye bye for everybody. Enjoy this check. Thank you so much. Please, please, please like, please like this video. <laughs>